Thank you very much, Mark, Sherman, and uh, Anne, and, and, uh, and thank you for raising a number of questions. Mark, would you like to address one or two of these questions, or shall we take questions from the audience? Not all of them, please. Not all of them. Okay, yes, thanks. Do it one or okay. two, and then we open up for discussion. Yeah, okay. I can go. The subsidy regimes and the scenarios I sent are, are assuming continued current levels of protection. We also do do in the, in the report some some SARAs with with greater protection and with liberalization. The uh, great question on, on productivity growth. We we can't currently uh, separate it out as well as we'd like in terms of the specific investments. We have just started a project, in fact, to look at much more detail on uh, what specific traits and where to invest in and, and the links and the uh, relative investments in, in the crop development versus uh, on-farm uh, systems and extension. So that, that's down the line, but it would be, a, as you said, a big step forward. Uh, on irrigation, the, the, the benefits to irrigation efficiency improvement are much higher in Asia, as you pointed out, and that's mainly because of a much larger base. But we do show significant scope for expansion of irrigation in Africa, but from a very low base, so it doesn't show up as highly in, in the models. Uh, your point on uh, nutrient impacts of, 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 of climate change are, are very important. You know, the, the emerging results are, are showing very uh, significant reductions in the nutrient value of, of major food crops. Uh, it, you know, it's not a fully, fully developed and comprehensive, but it, it looks that it's easily going to wash out any possible effect, uh, positive effects from CO2 fertilization, for example, in terms of netting out the, the benefits. Uh, meat demand, uh, we do have highly disaggregated by country. It just wasn't shown here. Uh, crop modeling, that's, I, I'd, I'd say it's not quite as bad as you say, but it, they definitely need work. And in fact, there's, we're, there's a group of people and, and institutions trying to, that have just put together a consortium to try to do uh, major uh, uh, validation calibration across a number of these crop models uh, against uh, m much more detailed, uh, uh, much more detailed experiment station data and so forth that I think could bring them forward rapidly if it all works out in the next two to three years. Thank you very uh, much, Sherman Mark. wants to say a couple of things. Yes. Uh, I guess j just a quick point uh, on the price price results and the policy implications of that. I mean, the the, the impact model in, in most of those scenarios, you're seeing significant rises in prices. Uh, that is a somewhat controversial result. There's a debate out there. Um, you can get people arguing that no, it, it, it and it is very sensitive to the productivity growth scenarios or assumptions you make in these models, in both the genetic equilibrium models and in the uh, partial equilibrium models. However, uh, you know, there's no fetish about zero here. N widespread agreement is that the century-long decline in the relative price of agriculture is over. There are some, there's some people that view that it ended, in fact, in the late, sometime in the 1990s. Uh, Colin Thurtle at Imperial College has been arguing this strongly. But in any case, nobody's forecasting forward any continued decrease in prices. There's actually, that has actually very important implications for something we, neither of these papers nor the reports have considered, is what are the implications of that for agricultural policy in the OECD countries, which are all predicated on price supports and all that sort of thing. Uh, we, may, we may be seeing a very different environment and it probably needs to be looked at. It probably needs to be looked at carefully. The issue, though, of price variability, which both reports tended to neglect, um, is, is, I agree, very important. And in separate work with country models, there's been a lot more work done on variability. And in, and in fact, one whole part of the uh, Foresight project is reviewing variability issues. The argument from looking at the literature is that there doesn't seem to be at the moment any serious increase in variability compared historically. But there are some reasons to think that it will be higher variability in the future. So that's, that's an interesting point. Just the last couple of price spikes are interesting, but not out of, by no means, not out of historical ranges at all. So uh, I think I'll stop there. Let's Thank get, you very open much. the discussion. Um, why don't I open up the uh, for questions and comments, and I take a first round if that's okay with you. We have a mics coming around the room. If you could tell us your name, institution, and keep comments brief because I already see about eight or ten hands coming up. Yeah, uh, I'm Jed Schilling with the Millennium Institute, and I've got a couple of quick questions for each of our main speakers. Uh, first, with Mark. Um, 
in one of your last slides, all of the lines had a very sharp kink in about 2025, and I wonder what agricultural miracle occurred then to shoot those up. Um, but more broadly, when you're talking about agriculture over the longer term, does the model take account of the uh, greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture? Because it's a major, major emitter, and a lot of the modern techniques, which are presumably going um, to be the basis for the growth, uh, do a lot of that, and the shift to livestock and industrial livestock also does that. So to what extent are those taken into account where you get a negative feedback? Um, it was Sherman on the trade issues. Um, I do think getting rid of the subsidies and all the other interferences in the market would be very good. I'm not sure it's politically possible, but we'll leave that aside for the moment. But in um, trading food, when there's a shortage for various reasons, uh, one, do you take account the transportation costs and things like that and how that figures in? And two, uh, this is a speculation, but suppose in Bangladesh, local people can't afford more than $1.50 a bushel for um, rice, and the Chinese are willing to pay $2 a bushel. So does the model keep track of what happens to nutrition levels in the various countries when trade dominates over things like that? Apologies, I think we're just sorting out some... Sorry, I don't something. speak Spanish. <laughs> yeah, neither do I. Why don't you pass the microphone next to you? Okay. Yeah. I think we have people joining us virtually and maybe somebody got disconnected. Uh, okay. Picture now from the Population Action International I used to be at the Trump Global Change Research Institute. One of the things that I've noted is that if you price carbon anyway at all, it changes the asset value of land dramatically. So if it's $100 a ton, you're talking, you know, $10,000 per hectare or up for the, for the carbon content of the land. And I wondered if anybody has thought at all about the structure, what that does to economic decision making on the farm. Thank you. There was a hand right behind you. I'm going to take this side of the room and then I'll come to this side. Hi, Melissa Ho, the Congressional Research Service. Um, I have a two-part question for the modelers and then the second part is for the policymaker. Um, I, I'm wondering, does the, do the, your models uh, take, or, or was one of the assumptions a stable crop uh, area dedicated to the specific uh, stable crops? In the sense that um, you, you may or may not be familiar with David Lobel's work from Stanford showing whole shifts in ecozones of where certain crops are even going to be um, suitable or adapted to those regions, and, and do your models take into account that you may not even want to grow corn in certain parts of southern Africa, for instance, um, and, and changing uh, productivity based on shifting uh, production in different, to different regions? And then for policymaker, um, I, I'm curious, um, there's a lot of talk about how the private sector is already moving to act and implement on climate uh, and, and doing climate adaptation, whereas policymakers are still kind of spinning their wheels around this. And the, fe the future initiative, which you mentioned, I'm curious if you could comment on any specific uh, changes or, or approaches that the initiative is taking um, to, to consider climate adaptation in the programming. You mentioned research, which I think is really critical to find out research topics um, and, and things to, to move for enhancement of productivity. But I'm curious, even programmatically and implementation-wise, how is climate adaptation being considered? Thank you. I'll take one last uh, hand. I'm sorry, this one right at the back. No. I'll come back. No way. Thank you, Howarth Booth from IFPRI. Uh, Mark, you may be understating the effects on food security, the bad effects on food security. Um, in the baseline scenario, you have uh, food staple prices going up by 50% and yet calorie consumption increasing. So you're probably making an assumption about income increases for the poor, that it's even, so you have a substantial reduction in poverty. Second point is you're looking only at calories and you're not looking at dietary quality, mineral and vitamin nutrition. Probably non-staple food prices are also increasing. You'll get a decline in uh, dietary quality. And the third point is the price variability. When you do get the, the price spikes, you'll get, you get some especially negative uh, impacts on nutrition. 
Thank you. Why don't I give the uh, panelists a chance to respond here, and then I'll come to this side of the room. I have one question myself for Anne. And you asked the question, where to invest research dollars? And I, I have a related question, where to invest communication dollars? Because I don't think we're quite making the connection to communication. But uh, why don't we begin now, uh, whichever order. Mark, do you want to begin first? Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's where the, uh, there's a transition to somewhat less land using uh, biofuels. It, it, it doesn't look quite that horrible in a, in a broader uh, presentation, but yeah, that's, that's what that, that is. We don't have the feedback effects directly. We use the GHG emissions from the, from the uh, GCMs. We, the, the changes in, in, across scenarios in agriculture would, as you point, ideally be fed back in. I doubt that they'd be huge in, in the kinds of scenarios we showed, but it, it would be a very good thing to, to explore uh, better. Hugh, yeah, I, we don't look directly at that in this particular model. Of course, you know that your colleagues at the Pacific Northwest Laboratory have done excellent work on looking at how uh, the cha changes in, in prices of carbon affect land use change. And it, it, it can work in different ways. In, 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 some, of this, in some scenarios, you, you, act, you actually get a very, a very significant shift out of uh, food crops, for example, into energy crops and so forth. So it can have a, actually a very negative uh, effect. Under other assumptions, that kind of uh, carbon pricing can induce more sustainable uh, producti uh, production practices in, in food and, and improve things. But not, none of those have been tested really very well at the farm level because of the fact that you know, you, you know, there's no, no example of those high prices you can do. But there is a lot of work going on now trying to look at how farmers would respond to uh, payments for environmental services or including carbon. So that literature, might, you might be able to tease out some of the kinds of responsibilities, but that, that's a really open field right now. So we don't assume, you know, like we don't say force corn to go out of uh, South, uh, South Africa. So we, we do have changes in, in, in area, depending on uh, the climate change has, du has direct impacts uh, in, in uh, physical, biophysical impacts that it, it, it can, can shift, say, Corn area northward in the U.S. Uh, up towards Canada. Significant areas go fallow in, in, in parts of the world where there's very high temperatures. So those kinds of effects are captured. There's also changes in, in uh, growth of area over time, depending on the uh, prices. So endo endogenous to the model as well. So we do account for several of those uh, factors. And Hadi, yeah, your points are all over very well taken. Uh, let me just pick up on a, one of, a couple of Jed's points. The issue of uh, transportation costs is actually significant. There's, you know, it, it is one of the debates out there, carbon miles, and we're going to close down the global transportation system. You know, one should remember that it was economic to move bulk grain around the world in as late as the early 20th century in sailing ships. You may not be aware of that. Um, but it does, have a, it does have a relevance for Howdy's question, because it does get to be a lot more expensive to move, move raspberries around by 747s. So, and and it's the, it's the uh, high value horticulture crops where you get a lot of the nutritional variety that actually will be affected. So you do get, you do get different effects from that. Um, the role of the land use models, that's, that's actually tricky. Let me, let me make two points. Someone said, gee, the, the scientists at the a ARS uh, said it's, you know, the climate change models are good, it's the, crop, the cropping models are terrible. I didn't say terrible. Said not as yeah, early. <laughs> early. Not an Etzel, but a Buick. <laughs> right. um, we just had a bunch of, uh, we've been doing a lot of work with the MIT Joint Center and re reviewing the climate change models, and we had one of the climate change change scientists down talking to us at a, a meeting of modelers. We have been working on an assumption that says we have this wide range of GCMs. One of the things we do is sort of take the extreme. So we, we did, if we did it, we did it with the World Bank, we did take the, the wettest and the driest. And we do the global wet and global dry. And then we also did similar things. We took the wettest for a particular country and the driest. And the argument is we, we'll have the domain. We will get a sensitivity analysis. We'll see the best and the worst. And this scientist from MIT cheerfully said, well, he said, you know, we have no particular confidence that the existing set of GCMs actually bounds the domain. He said, it may, may be twice as bad. We don't know. Um, so, which was depressing. <laughs> uh, um, 
Yeah, and then the, the other point, again, how do you raise, and it, it, it's just a, it, it's something we have to really work on, is variability. Bringing variability into the models, bringing variability into the decision-making process of policymakers is not easy. Jerry Nelson told a delightful story about Lyndon Johnson bringing in his economist and saying, I do not want to see a range of numbers. I want to see one number. Ranges are for cattle. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that attitude has to change. And we, I, I mean, working with policymakers around you do have a sense of that, 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 that they are much more aware of risks. It means you're looking for no regret investment scenarios if they exist. Uh, you, you really worry about timing. Can we delay something until we know more 10 years from now? It's, it's a basic philosophy of do not put off to, to, until tomorrow that which you can put off until the day after tomorrow. So, stop there. And so, um, before I answer the question that was, well, uh, it, let me answer Melissa's question because I think it, it captures a couple things I wanted to say. So, just being really frank, so, so the words climate change is important and is a cross-cutting uh, issue are in the Feed the Future strategy. I don't think we really have done a very good job thinking about what that means beyond the research. I mean, I think there there's a, a bit more understanding and engagement, but what does it mean for what kinds of investments we make in value chains? What does it mean for where we um, promote infrastructure investments? Um, you know, what does it mean for the balance of um, extension work versus, you know, training and technical, I mean, all of those things, I don't think we've really grappled with, and we're not seeing it coming out in the country strategies. Um, again, there's very general sort of, yes, we need to be concerned about climate change, but getting down to the level of, of what does that mean for where we, where we or the countries put specific dollars, we're not there yet. I mean, and that's why I think this kind of analysis can be really helpful because it starts at least pointing you in some directions on, on the uh, investments that you would, you would want to make and the choices that you have. Um, but just connecting the point um, in the back with that, so, you know, one of the key pieces of the Feed the Future strategy is around um, integrating nutrition into agriculture as opposed to sort of continuing to see it as a, as a more of a healthcare-based intervention. And of course, that means um, um, creating more diversity in crops, including horticulture. And so, you know, if you believe that you're going to see significant changes in the micronutrients that might be part of that, those products, or you think you've got transportation problem, you know, challenges because of um, increased oil prices or whatever, um, it's going to make a huge difference on the kind of um, choices we make about you know, what kinds of horticultural crops to, to produce and where. Um, so that's one connection I would just make between you, what you had asked Melissa and the, and the point in the back. Um, in terms of the, the communications money, so you know, I think there, there's sort of um, several audiences. Um, I do think we, as a community, neglect talking to farmers directly um, through, there are a number of farm publications that I think if, if we can um, get it down to one number, <laughs> um, you know, going out and you know, feed stuffs and, and all of those kinds of, of newspapers that, that farmers read and, and where you can actually con communicate to farmers directly, I think um, is one place I would maybe that we should all maybe be investing a little more communications money. I do think because you are seeing the business community confronting this, as I was mentioning, in an in a, um, important way, and maybe more to the point, the finance community, who is really, I mean, there were bankers there saying, we are not approving loans for anybody unless they can prove to us where they're going to get the water to process you know, the sugar or the grain or whatever. I mean, I think you're, you're I mean, and politicians listen to those guys. So I think if you can get the business and the finance community who already do get a lot of these issues to start um, being a bit more vocal, that also is, is uh, uh, I think, a big help. Um, the other is, is really 
in terms of communicating to sort of average citizens is I think the NGOs have a you know huge credibility um, in this area. Um, was stunning to me again that my former CEO was thankful for the world, role that World Wildlife Federation has been playing in terms of um, convincing them and pointing out some issues to them that they might not have dealt with. So I think you there are groups like that that. Um, you know, may be able to communicate some of these results again in a, in a um, more direct way to um, sort of constituents and, and um, citizens than sometimes we in the, the, I don't know, more research end of the business can do. Thank you very much. Let me open up the round over here. I neglected the side. Mauricia, there's a lady right next to you. Hello, Colleen Rozier from the USDA. Um, and my question is for you, Mark. Um, reading through, you had several different scenarios of productivity gains and then the impacts that those had on malnutrition. And my question is more about market access because there's a lot of rural communities, a lot of people around the world that maybe don't have access to international or region re even regional markets. So my question is, do you take into account current market access or an increasing market access? I know the United States is doing a lot of work as well as other countries around the world in kind of opening up markets. So that's my question. Thank you. Did I miss hands on this side? Well, maybe I was, yes, there was a hand over there. Thank you. Yeah, hi, uh, thanks. I'm Christopher Krauss from the National Environmental Education Foundation. Um, I, I just was kind of curious if you can maybe elaborate a little bit on your assumptions regarding uh, land use change um, if that's, uh, uh, for in terms of changing crop production as well as areas that are uh, currently uh, natural areas that uh, may be converted to uh, agriculture purposes. Thanks. Thank you. This side is definitely more active. <laughs> I have uh, a gentleman at the end over there who's been asking. Sorry, Charlotte. Thank you. Hello. Uh, Carlos Ludeña from the Inter-American Development Bank. Uh, my question was, uh, you, uh, Anne mentioned about price variability. Uh, uh, I was thinking uh, more on the what about the climate change variability and by that uh, by that I mean like uh, the effects or the impacts of uh, uh, extreme e events uh, the the frequency and the and the intensity of these uh, for example droughts uh, uh, temperatures and how would that change the the assumption of of the increase in forty percent of uh, productivity growth and a second one related to that is about the if you have looked at the historical uh, how how the historical evidence basically uh, shows this link between uh, extreme events and, and changes in productivity growth. Thank you very much. Let me come back. I missed a hand over here, Charlotte. Uh, you know, I just wanted to balance out the sides a little bit. Um, <laughs> it's just an observation. I'm I'm thinking of what Sherman said about putting off until the day after tomorrow or the day after the day after that. Um, and also Anne's points on communication, it seems to me if you look at both the climate change and the international trade negotiations, I mean, they're, they're not going anywhere, right? And, and I think the key reason is the, the tough economy that we're in. And yet everything you're showing us here indicates that if we don't move on climate change, if we don't move on uh, fighting protectionism, we're going to be even worse off. So how do we, how do we get that? through to people um, in, in, in explaining that there is indeed a real problem here. Do we somehow need to be creative about how we couch these negotiations? Should we have food security negotiations? I mean, what do we need to do in order to sort of raise the alarm bells a little bit about some of these issues? Because right now, I think all of these things seem like luxuries that you just can't afford to do in very tough economic times. Thank you. Mauricia, the two hands over here and uh, the final hands. I think the gentleman behind there, right there. Uh, thank you, David Lambert, DPL. I, I, I was just sitting here wishing that our key congressional committees could be present at this session. It's extraordinarily valuable for them. And how they would completely look at their the agricultural research budgets in a different way. Just for example, on horticulture and those crops that have such high nutritional value, the impact of climate change, not only on those crops, but on post-harvest loss. And the Global Coal Chain Alliance recently said that on the horticulture budgets, 95% goes to production and 5% goes to post-harvest loss 
and yet in some of these crops we lose 50, 60, 70 percent. It's just, uh, this is just a very valuable session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me on that note turn to our panel here and uh, just um, picking up a little on Charlotte's point. It's a very interesting communications angle that you're also taking over there. How do we reframe the way in which you're presenting some of these issues? Let me come back. Shall we go with reverse order here, And I was actually thinking about this on the um, plane back in terms of um, there were a number of Asians who were at this meeting who are all of a sudden after 2008 and looking at what's starting to happen again, really well aware of the importance of rules <laughs> in preventing the uh, kind of export restrictions. And, and they, they know that that's not part of the WTO negotiations, but all of a sudden they're starting to think, oh man, the rules of the game are really important to us. And I, I don't think that I don't know that this argument would have much impact, the points that were made here, on the climate change negotiations, but I do think it can have some impact on, on the WTO. I mean, I think a lot of the sort of political economy of those negotiations is shifting, in part because of the export restrictions, in part because I think many African countries are now um, seeing more value in trade, regional trade investment than they were even five years ago. So I think talking about this much more as, you know, a food security issue, a way to ameliorate climate change um, in ways that, that don't require a big investment of research dollars or other dollars, I think we can, we can reframe some of the WTO issues or trade negotiation issues around food security. So I think you're absolutely right. A couple of points on this um, from, from the IDB, this issue of extreme events. Um, yes, we do expect to see more. We've been doing work in individual countries, and you start seeing in the latter part, middle of the century, you start seeing these extreme events showing up in the climate change models. And there we're doing, we are doing stochastic stuff. We are looking draws from these, these the GCMs. But for example, we're looking at Ethiopia and in the last 10 years, somewhere around 2050, you get a decade where they have 300-year floods. That's distressing. Uh, what, what makes that sort of thing especially worrying is gets back to a question you raised on uh, you know, changing land use patterns. One view is can we, can, can we learn, can we use histor history to guide us? I mean, after all, we've seen a lot of climate change out there in the historical record. Is that going to tell us? So if if parts of northern Canada are going to start looking like Ohio, can we just say, okay, let's see what they would grow if they were Ohio? And it doesn't seem to be quite right. I mean, it, it's worrisome. It may well be that certainly with the large temperature changes, you're basically outside the dom historical domain, in which case we're in real trouble because it makes, makes our life a lot harder to try to figure these things out. In terms of the timing and the sense of urgency, I, we just absolutely flat out agree. Yes, you need to get some sense of urgency. My point about delaying is in, an, in this uncertain world, if we don't know how these climate change scenarios are going to play out, you don't want to lock yourself into a 30-year investment program that may, if you can avoid it, that can turn out to be wrong. Some you, you do. So, for example, you should be designing and building more extreme event resistant roads, which is both temperature and water, and is not very expensive to do if you start out that way. Uh, dams are difficult. If you, if you build dams for dry, dry scenarios and you turn out to get wet scenarios, you turned out to have overbuilt. And that's pretty expensive, but they take a long time, so you really do have to face that. So it, it's an issue of timing of investment becomes, and this uncertainty is facing climate, is facing policymakers with with a different way of having to think about it. Mark, even as you address the question, there were a lot of demands put on you for research. And yeah. it'd be very interesting to see where do you <laughs> think the next frontier is. Yeah, well, well so in fact, some of them are come up here that. Uh, yeah, on the market access issue, that yeah, the scenarios we showed here ba basically assume more or less the same access, but then we do have other analyses, which I'm, I'm not sure are in this report, for example, where we, we do significant increases in investment in, in infrastructure to improve access 
and reduce uh, marketing margins, and those do show significant improvements in, in productivity and income at the farm level. So those are very important variables uh, to consider. Land use changes, in fact, that is a, a, a next step that we're working on now. Right now, we, we can show the, the changes in land use by crops, but we, don't, we aren't able to pinpoint where, the, where they come from within, within the country. So we can't say that X amount of it is from tropical forest, X, Y is that. We are doing that land use modeling uh, right now, but it could be probably a few months before we can say well enough how, how, how those effects are. So that is something we're, we're working on. Climate variability, again, uh, that's, we haven't done in the global model. We have done some of that kind of analysis, again, in, in Ethiopia, for example, where we did assessments that showed, in fact, that, that uh, major negative impacts of drought do have long-term growth effects because it de basically decapitalizes farming both at the farm level and the public infrastructure and has long-term effects. We haven't been able to do that kind of stuff here. And if, if you have some of that historical empirical work, I'd be, I'd be interested in, in, in talking to you about that. Um, so yeah, I, th I think land use change is, is, is one, of, one of the big issues uh, going forward in, ter in terms of what's going to happen. Uh, continued work on uh, on, on water resources and how that's going to change in, in climate change, but that's probably dependent, again, on, on improvement in, in the GCMs is, a, is another huge area. So. Sounds good. Why don't I bring the meeting to a close? What I took away from this year, discussion over here, incredibly informed audience that is asking a lot of questions and putting a lot of ideas on the table. I took away also several consistent themes. Variability, variability, variability. <laughs> I took away concerns regarding the focus on uh, calorie versus nutrition, I, and, and the, raise, the questions that that raises. I took away issues of land use, obviously, and uh, extreme events and the like. But I also took away two very interesting uh, things. I took away a uh, plea for where exactly to focus research dollars. I think you raised a very interesting question. I think that is a question mark that you and your team may also want to look at, not just what research, but you know, where are some of the bigger bang for the buck for the research that you do? Mm -hmm. And I also took away the how to reframe the discourse or the need to reframe the discourse and the need to think creatively about how we reframe the discourse so that we are bringing others into this discourse. Uh, David, your point that you raised, how do we bring other and, uh, and other audiences into this discourse so that there's actually a meaningful discourse that goes beyond just talking? But I thank all of you for taking the time to join us here, and I hope that you'll come back uh, for other events in the future. Thank you.